Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'd like to wish Victor a very happy 80th birthday. Uh, he has an enthusiasm for mathematics, which is just infectious, and he's wonderful for the subject. Um, I'd like to talk about homotopical rigidity for quasi-toric manifolds over a cube. So this is joint work with Xin Fu, Larry So, and Zhang Rex Song. Oops. So rigidity problems in general, if you have smooth compact manifolds, you could ask a very naive question, which is if there is a ring isomorphism between them in cohomology, does that induce a diffeomorphism? In general, this is far from true. Uh, it fails spectacularly for simply connected four manifolds, for example. But for some, some families of manifolds, it is true. And if it does hold for a family of manifolds, uh, they're called cohomologically rigid. Uh, one special case that was recently proved by Choi, Huang, and Jiang is that bot manifolds are cohomologically rigid. Um, we will talk about a homotopical analog of this, where you replace diffeomorphism by homotopy equivalence uh, and replace uh, an arbitrary manifold by a quasi-toric manifold. But to, to get there, we need a little bit of buildup. So uh, to get to a quasi-toric manifold, we first talk about moment angle complexes. So suppose you have a simplicial complex K on M vertices, and you think of the empty set as one of the faces of K. Uh, for a face in K, uh, start with a pair of a disk and a circle. And for that face, you look at a product which is a subproduct of disks. And in each component, you'll include a disk if the index i is, is in sigma and a circle if it's not. And the moment angle complex for that simplicial complex is you take the union over all of the faces of these D2 S1 sigma spaces. So in particular, um, it's a subspace of a product of M copies of the disk. And on each of the disks, there's an action of a circle. So you get an action of a, an M torus on that product. And that descends to an action of the M torus on that moment angle complex. So for example, um, lots of different spaces can show up as moment angle complexes. If you take a simple example where K is just two disjoint points, at the faces of K, you can enumerate. There's the empty set, there's the vertex one and the vertex two. And if you go through the construction, so the D2 S1 for the empty set is just each of the vertices uh, is missing. So you put in the smaller subspace, the S1 in each component. So you get S1 cross S1. Uh, for the vertex one, it's just the one vertex there. So in position one, you'd put the disc and position two, you put the circle. And then the opposite is true for the uh, vertex two case. And then you take the union of all these things. So you would end up with D2 cross S1, union S1 cross D2 over S1 cross S1. And that's a way of writing the three sphere. A quasi-toric manifold. Uh, so you start with an n-dimensional simple convex polytope with m facets. Uh, you say that uh, uh, action is locally standard. Uh, if there's a torus acting on it, uh, which locally looks like it's a torus acting in, in the usual way on a copy of CM. And a quasi-toric manifold over a fixed polytope P uh, is a closed smooth two n-dimensional manifold with a smooth locally standard torus action for which the orbit space is homeomorphic to the polytope that you start with. Um, that definition uh, is great for geometry, but it's not so great for topology. Uh, for, for topology, 
Hochstraber and Panoff showed that any quasi-toric manifold can be realized as a certain quotient. Uh, it will be the moment angle comp a moment angle complex modulo a torus, where the simplicial complex K in the moment angle complex is take your polytope P, take its boundary and dualize. And on that simplicial complex, right, there was an action of an M torus and take a sub torus of uh, dimension M minus N sitting inside that M torus that acts freely. And this doesn't have to be a coordinate wise inclusion. It, you could have lots of uh, diagonal maps involved. So for example, uh, a very simple polytope, you start with just an interval. So that has dimension one, it's got two facets, which are two endpoints. Its boundary is just the two endpoints. And when you dualize, you get two points. So your simplicial complex K in this case is two points. The corresponding moment angle complex, we saw that already, that's S3, but written in a coordinate wise fashion as, as a D2 cross S1 union S1 cross D2 over the common S1 cross S1. The torus in this case, the big torus is the S1 cross S1 and it acts coordinate wise on that moment angle complex in the sort of obvious way. And if you include diagonally, then you get a free action on the moment angle complex. And when you take its quotient, the quasi-toric manifold that you get is an S2. So this is this is just the Hoff, the Hoff map, really. So you're displaying S2 as a quasi-toric manifold. Okay. Um, there's lots of interesting things you could say about homotopy types of moment angle complexes. Uh, the S3 comes up uh, in this particular example and lots of other sort of interesting uh, way of spaces come up, uh, particularly when you start with uh, a polytope, take its boundary and dualize. Uh, and it's, it's a major problem to figure out even what the homotopy types of these things are. Um, in terms of rigidity, um, for the class of quasi-toric manifolds, Masuda and Su uh, were investigating uh, rigidity problems and sort of had the intuition that there was something special about quasi-toric manifolds and possibly the rigidity problem actually held there. So they asked if M and M are quasi-toric manifolds and you have a ring isomorphism in cohomology, do you get a diffeomorphism? This is still an open problem and a lot of work has been done in this direction. So recently, I already mentioned that Choi, Huang and Chang showed that bot manifolds are uh, satisfy this. So they're cohomologically rigid. And this was the culmination of maybe 15 years worth of work on the part of you know, Choi and a whole lot of collaborators. I won't name them all, but there was many people involved with this. Um, in a slightly different direction, uh, Sui showed that if you look at quasi-toric manifolds over the three-dimensional cube, then they satisfy rigidity. And Buchstaber, Erkovitz, Masuda, Panov, and Park showed that if you look at quasi-toric manifolds over a three-dimensional Pogorelov polytope, that also satisfies rigidity. So Pogorelov means uh, it's so it's written there flag and no four belts. But what that essentially means is that you can't have any facets that are triangles or squares, but things like pentagons and hexagons and such are okay. So a, a football is a pogorel of polytope, uh, but many other things are not. Okay, so there's, there's several families of quasi-toric manifolds that satisfy this rigidity property. Um, and it's not clear. I don't think there's, at this point, the evidence points to Masuda and Sue's question as having a positive answer, but I think we're probably far away from that. Um, you could ask 
a, a slightly different question. You could ask, well, what if I replace the diffeomorphism property with a homeomorphism? Uh, and I guess the, you know, the geometers would, who have been investigating this would say that it, that doesn't seem to ease the problem at all. It seems to be as, as difficult. So you could weaken it further and say, well, what if I replace the diffeomorphism by a homotopy equivalence? And that's the, that's the idea here. So if M and N are quasi-toric manifolds, and there's a ring isomorphism in cohomology, do you get a homotopy equivalence? And the, the theorem that Shin Fu, Larry So, John Beck Song, and I have is that uh, it's, you do provided uh, certain conditions for it. So you start with two quasi-toric manifolds over a cube. So you've specified the polytope. Uh, and if there's a ring isomorphism in cohomology, then if you localize away from primes less than or equal to n, where n is the two n is the dimension of the manifold, then you get a homotopy equivalence between the two manifolds. Um, and in particular, if you want to look rationally, then you will always get a homotopy equivalence for these quasi toric manifolds over a cube with isomorphic cohomology. Right. So there's a, a couple of things to explain about this that we get to as we go along. One is uh, where where did this localization come from? Right. This this is something that's you know topologists are quite happy with, but the geometers are not so happy with. Um, and why the cube? Why specify to the cube? So uh, let's see. So we'll go through the argument or, or the, the, the main parts of the argument. And there's some properties of quasi-toric manifolds that we'll need along the way. Uh, most of them are very generic. Okay, so to begin with, uh, any quasi-toric manifold, the Bookshaw-Rapanov result shows that you can express that as a quotient where you have an associated moment angle complex mod out uh, torus. And that quotient means you have a principal vibration. So, you, so the, the quasi-toric manifold sits as the base the moment angle complex as the total space and the torus is the fiber. And the fact that it's principal means it classifies to a homotopy vibration where now the total space is the quasi-toric manifold. The base is the classifying space of the torus and the fiber is the moment angle complex. And there are some known properties. Um, one is that the moment angle complex is too connected. And that immediately applies from this vibration that M is simply connected, the quasi-toric manifold, and the map from M into the classifying space of the torus induces an isomorphism in degree two cohomology. Something you can't read off right away, but which is true, is that the degree two cohomology of the quasi-toric manifold generates all its cohomology. There's also some relations, all right? Um, I won't go into the explicit description of the cohomology of the quasi-toric manifold, but you can you know, write it down. Uh, but the point is that uh, for us, the main point is that it means that all of the cohomology happens in even degrees. So as a CW complex, uh, this quasi-toric manifold has cells only in even dimensions. And one more thing you can read off from this vibration is that because the torus is an island burden claim space, so is its classifying space. And that means that the, the higher homotopy groups of the quasi-toric manifold M are the same as the higher homotopy groups of the moment angle complex, where by higher, I mean in any dimension bigger than or equal to three. So these are all generic properties of that hold for any quasi-toric manifold. Uh, 
the cube only enters into it. Uh, it doesn't really enter into it yet, but just keeping track of what it's doing. So if you have the polytope being a cube and you look at the associated moment angle complex, so you take the boundary of the cube and then you dualize, what you get is the n-fold join of two points. We saw that in our example of the moment angle complex that if you have two points, the corresponding moment angle complex is a three sphere and a join of simplicial complexes corresponds to a product of moment angle complexes. So for this iterated join of n copies of two points, the corresponding moment angle complex is a product of n copies of the three sphere. So that will, that will show up later, but that's just something to, to keep in mind for the moment. So what is the, the strategy for the proof? Um, suppose you have a ring isomorphism between the cohomology of M and the cohomology of N, and they're both quasi-toric manifolds over a Q. Um, we saw that the, the, the all of the cells of M or N are in even dimensions. So we could look at building them up in terms of their skeletons. And we only have to look at every second skeleton because uh, there are no odd dimensional cells. So you get a co-fibration for uh, the 2K minus two skeleton passing to the 2K skeleton for M, where you attach a bunch of 2K minus one spheres and similarly for N. And the goal is to inductively construct homotopy equivalences, skeleton by skeleton, uh, until you get to uh, the end, where you would have the, the 2n skeleton of M and the 2n skeleton of N being M and N respectively. So to build this up, um, there's several cases, or there's three cases really. Um, so the first case, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, if K is one, so you're looking at the two skeleton of M or N, and you can just read that off from cohomology. So the, the secondary cohomology of M is isomorphic to the secondary cohomology of N by hypothesis. All you need is an isomorphism as modules. There's no ring structure involved yet. And because of the connectivity of the spaces involved and the fact that there's no three cells, it says that the two skeleton of M is going to be a wedge of S2s. And the same thing is going to happen to the two skeleton of M. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, the K equals two case uh, is a little bit more involved. Uh, in terms of the induction, it's the K equals two case that's really the base case, not the K equals one case. It's a sort of uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, an initial case, but it's not really the base case of the induction. Uh, for the K equals two case, uh, you're looking at an attaching map, uh, say for in the M case, where you would have a wedge of uh, S3s mapping to a wedge of S2s. And you look at what that map is doing. So if you restrict to each S3, you have uh, a representative of an element in pi three of a wedge of two spheres. And the Hilton-Milner theorem describes these kinds of maps. It would say that you end up with a, a sum of multiples of Hopfen grain one elements, uh, etas, and whitehead products of distinct two spheres in the, in the wedge. And the interesting thing is that uh, in cohomology, that Hopfen variant one element is detected by a cup product square, and the whitehead product of two distinct spheres is detected by the cup product of the corresponding cohomology classes. Right? So, so the homotopy class of this attaching map F2 is completely determined just by cup products. So the, now the ring structure is entering into the picture. And the fact that you have this isomorphism 
between the cohomology of M and the cohomology of N as rings uh, means you're in business. So the, the statement here is that linear algebra shows that the four skeleton of M and the four skeleton of N are the same. Uh, to kind of spell it out a bit, uh, if you think about uh, uh, trying to produce uh, a map between the, the skeletons for M and the skeletons for N, in this case, inductively, you've got a map between the two skeletons, by the k equals one case, and you know the homotopy class of the attaching map F2, you know the homotopy class of the attaching map G2, and with a little bit of linear algebra, you can show that you can produce a map between the wedge of S3s, which makes the square here commute, and then that would induce a map of four skeleton, which you can show as a homotopy. The, the, the point to carry away here is really that the, the cup product structure is, is doing everything in this k equals two case. Uh, for k bigger than or equal to three, uh, now, you, now we begin the induction properly. So you suppose that the two k minus two skeleton of M and the two k minus two skeleton of N are homotopy equivalent. And we want to produce a homotopy equivalence between the two K skeletons. And the claim is that if you localize away from primes less than or equal to K, then the attaching map that produces the two K skeleton induces an isomorphism on pi two K minus one. Okay. Grant this for the moment, and let's just see how that solves the problem. And we'll come back to it later. So assuming the claim works, then what happens? Well, uh, you have a three legs of a square here involving FK, GK, and the inductively assumed homotopy equivalence between 2K minus two skeletons. If FK is inducing an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one, and inductively, and you also assume GKs as well, then this isomorphism between 2K minus two skeletons is also inducing an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one. So if you do FK followed by the equivalence of 2K minus two skeletons, that's an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one, which lifts through the isomorphisms for the isomorphism GK to produce a map EK and, and commutativity of the picture says that that would also be an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one. So now, now you've got a map, a self map of a wedge of 2K minus one spheres, which induces an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one. And the Horebich theorem would say that that implies that it induces an isomorphism uh, in homology. And Whitehead's theorem says then that EK has to be a homotopy equivalence, right? So you end up with a square where a commutative square where both the vertical maps are homotopy equivalences. Now you can take cofibers and look at the effect on, on the 2K skeletons. So you get a cofibration diagram, some induced map epsilon K between the 2K skeletons and you think about what this is doing. So uh, each of the rows is a cofibration, which means it induces a long exact sequence of homology groups. And, and you have a, a map of cofibrations, which induces a map of long exact sequences. E EK and the inductively constructed homotopy equivalents on 2K minus two skeletons, these are isomorphisms. So the five limit tells you that epsilon k in homology also has to induce an isomorphism. And Whitehead's theorem tells you that epsilon k is a homotopy equivalence. And that's the inductance. So now you just keep going, you iterate through until you get to the two n skeletons, which are m and n respectively. And remembering that uh, for the claim, 
you had to invert primes less than or equal to k at each stage. And the final stage is k equals n. So as long as you invert all the primes less than or equal to n, you end up with this homotopy. Right, so that's that's the strategy, and and all that's really left is is figuring out why the claim holds. So this claim says that if you localize away from primes less than or equal to k, then that attaching map producing the two k skeleton induces an isomorphism on phi two k minus one. Okay, so why why is that true? There's two steps to this. Um, uh, the first one is, is start with the 2K minus two skeleton, including into the 2K skeleton and take its fiber, give it a name, call it FK. So, so you end up with uh, fibration here along the bottom and Look at the attaching map FK. It composes trivially into the 2K skeleton because that's the attaching map that produces it. So it lifts to this fiber FK by some map lambda K. So the, the game is to show that FK induces an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one by showing that lambda K does and SK does. So step one is really, really to show that lambda k is an isomorphism on pi 2k minus one. And step two is to show that sk is. So for lambda k, um, there's a Blaker's Massey theorem that run, is running around. So Blaker's Massey says, if you start with a co-fibration A to B to C, and you take the fiber of B to C, then A lifts to that fiber and will be a homotopy equivalence through a dimensional range that depends on the connectivity of the spaces involved. And at some boundary dimension, uh, you won't get an isomorphism, but you, you, you will get a, an epimorphism on homotopy groups. So if you apply uh, Blaker's Massey to this situation for lambda k, you find that. Um, because M is simply connected, lambda K is right on that boundary. So all Blaker's Massey says is that lambda K induces an epimorphism in homotopic groups. But we want something a little bit stronger. We want something that's an isomorphism. So we, we've got to dig a little deeper. And the way to do that is uh, to take these to take the, the 2K minus two and 2K skeletons, uh, think of them mapping into the quasi-toric manifold as a whole, which maps into this classifying space of a torus and take fibers. So we'll look at the 2K minus two and 2K skeletons mapping into the classifying space of the torus and we take fibers in both cases. The nice thing is that both of those fibers have an extra dimension of connectivity as compared to the skeleton. And, and your attaching map FK is lifting upstairs to this fiber. And you can, because of that extra dimension of connectivity, you can look at a Blaker's Massey type argument upstairs at the level of the fibers and show that uh, if you play around a little bit, the map that you would get from the wedge of two, sorry, the, the map lambda k can be chosen to be an isomorphism on pi 2k minus one. All right. Um, at this point, uh, I'll, I'll take a time out just to say that um, we have not used the fact that our polytope is a cube at this point everything so far works for any quasi-toric manifold. So if we back up a little bit, right? So we go to the strategy of the proof. At no point have we mentioned anything about the polytope yet. So at this point, you imagine you have 
a cohomology ring isomorphism between two quasi toric manifolds, full stop. Then strategy for the proof works, step k equals one case works, the k equals two case works. Assuming the claim works, the strategy for the k bigger than or equal to three case works, and you end up with this, this homotopy equivalence, right? Now, why might, and when we look at the claim, so step one of the claim, the polytope has not yet entered a picture. So this, this also works for any case. It's only in step two when the polytope starts to come into the picture. Right, so I will I will look at this slide in the order it's not written in, sorry. Um, start down here with this vibration. You start with the 2K minus two skeleton included into the two skeleton has fiber FK, right? That produces some long exact sequence of homotopy groups. Uh, and we're going to look at that in dimension 2K minus one. Now, uh, at either end of that, you would have something about pi 2k minus one of the 2k skeleton and pi 2k of the 2k skeleton. If you knew that both of those groups were zero, then this map sk would have to induce an isomorphism on pi 2k minus one. And that's really what the claim is after. All right, so the, the goal is to try and put some condition on, on M that forces the 2K skeleton uh, to have trivial uh, homotopy groups in dimensions 2K minus one and 2K. Where is that coming from? Okay, so uh, now, we, now we can go back to the beginning of the slide. If you think about the 2K minus one and 2K homotopy groups of the 2K skeleton, remembering that uh, there are no cells in dimension 2K plus one, those two homotopy groups are isomorphic to the homotopy groups for M. So the skeletal inclusion uh, for the 2K skeleton into M induces an isomorphism on pi 2K minus one and pi 2K. So we may as well look at the homotopy groups of M and show that they are zero in dimensions 2K minus one and 2K. Now, when we do that, uh, we're in a dimensional range, which means that the 2K minus one homotopy group of M, for example, is the same as the 2K minus one homotopy group of the corresponding moment angle complex, where now K is for the cube. Because, uh, so when K is a cube, uh, we saw that the moment angle complex was a product of three spheres, right? So we're really looking at pi 2k minus one of a product of three spheres. Uh, so all, all that's important is, is pi 2k minus one of a, of a single three sphere. If we can control it, then we're in business. Mm -hmm. um, again, because k is bigger than or equal to three, pi 2k minus one of S3 is all torsion. The only, the only Z summoned in the homotopy groups of S3 occurs in dimension three. And more than that, we can describe the kinds of torsion that shows up. So it's, it's, it goes back to Toda, that the first non-trivial P torsion in the homotopy groups of S3 occurs in dimension two P. So if you localize away from primes less than or equal to K, then pi 2K minus one of S3 is zero. And this is where the localization comes from. So it's just get rid of, get rid of some torsion homotopy groups that are noise in some sense. The same argument shows that pi 2K of S3 is also zero if you localize away from primes less than or equal to K. And then that implies that pi 2k minus one and pi 2k of the 2k skeleton of M are both zero. And now you remember why we did this, because we were kind of looking at the homotopy groups uh, in this long exact sequence 
for this vibration, we take the 2K minus 2 skeleton in M, include it into the 2K skeleton, and take its fiber. Now on either end of that, we pi 2K minus 1 of the 2K skeleton, pi 2K of the 2K skeleton are both 0. So SK is inducing an isomorphism from pi 2K minus 1. And, and that means that the map lambda k and the map sk are inducing isomorphisms on pi 2k minus 1, so fk is. And that, that was really the, the, that proves the claim, right? And, and we saw that once we had the claim, we could just walk through the, the whole strategy to produce a homotopy. That's really the whole argument. Um, I think the thing to take away from this is that uh, it was working for all quasi-toric manifolds right up to the point where you had to deal with the 2K minus 1 and 2K homotopy groups of this 2K skeleton. Right? So if, if you could control that in some way uh, without localizing, and possibly you could improve this result. Or you could think of it another way. Um, the, the, the reason that we restricted to the cube was so that we could get a, a moment angle complex that was a product of three spheres. And we kind of had complete control over the homotopy groups of three spheres to the extent that we know that their, their torsion in these dimensions and, and what kind of torsion can appear. So we know exactly what to localize to just turn things into zeros. So you could say, you know, maybe you could generalize all of this, and this is what we're thinking of right now, to something like take a, a, a product of simplices as your polytope instead of, instead of just a cube. Um, so instead of just a product of intervals. Um, we don't have an answer for that yet. Uh, it gets a little bit tricky when you're trying to control these homotopy groups, but uh, we're, we're working on it. And hopefully there's something that can shake out of it at this point. But at least it works in the case of the, the cube. Um, so I seem to have uh, just streaked through this because I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Spasiba. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, hi, Stephen. Thank you for your beautiful talk. Uh, that's Taras, yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what about the connected sum of sphere products when you have those truncation polytopes, like at least in dimension three, for instance? Uh, I'm sure you have a grasp on that connected sum from the homotopy theoretical point of view when you just attach one cell using a sum of whitehead products. So um, are your method also extendable to that setting? Uh, uh, they might because They also, from geometrical point of view, that, that gives you a, quite an interesting class of quasi toric manifolds, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and I think they're also approachable from the homotopy theoretical point of view, probably. Yeah. When the I... moment angle complex is connected, some of sphere products, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I mean that. It could be. Um, I mean, as I said, the, the the only place where. You know, the polytope became important was this spot right at the end, which kind of said, you know, in, in this case, when you had a cube, you had a moment angle, corresponding moment angle complex, which is a product of three spheres, right? And then then you could sort of handle things easily. So, you know, could you, could you do other cases? Um, potentially, uh, it depends on what kind of control over the corresponding homotopy groups that you get. Um, we're looking into this. Um, th this is a sort of hot off the press uh, result. 
but I think uh, I think there's more that we can do. And and yeah, maybe this connected some case is, is another one we should look at. Maybe the first step would be to look at the product of odd dimensional spheres, but when you have just two spheres in the product, right? Can that's right. Yeah, so that that's that's kind of where we're looking at now. So if you're right. if, you're, if your polytope is a product of simplices, then your moment angle of complex is a product of odd dimensional spheres, and then what happens there? Yeah. All right. Thank you. It is Victor. Dear Sif, thank you very much for your talk. You. Uh, my question is such. Uh, you can see the case where two manifold isomorphism between ring of cohomology and uh, we, uh, you prove that they are homotopic equivalent. Yes? But in this case, can you give to us examples that such manifold homotopy equivalent not not near, not near, not not homeomorphic, uh, but in your case, <laughs> I I don't know of any examples. Um, if if Masuda and Sue's question is correct, then there are no such examples. <laughs> <laughs> because if uh, we should like better understood what your result, if you give to us example, you agree? Uh, yes, you agree? I mean, it, it would be great to be able to find some some case that distinguishes between the two, but I, I don't know of any yet. Okay, we will wait. Okay, thank you. Well, any other questions or comments? Well, so let's thank Stephen again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we have a break till 1730. Uh, no announcement yet. Yeah. So, since we have some time. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, tonight, as I said, we'll have a party at seven o'clock. So we start from here, but for those of you maybe accompanying persons who want to join us, it's um, now we have more concrete information. It's second floor of the Omega Sirius Hotel. It's called Hall Turin, Zal Turin. The party will be there, right? Omega Sirius Hotel, Turin, or Torino, whatever, hall. Uh, and also tomorrow, after the first talk, before the coffee break, we'll have a conference photo here. So please do not leave immediately, and we will probably gather here on this podium and, and take a photo. Yes, so that's tomorrow after the first talk. Today, when we go to this hotel for second floor, how we can obtain permission to go to this hotel? Or without permission? Is this free? It's not. It's not a serious. Sorry. Problem. They don't check passport there. Yeah, so. uh, passport here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, are you?